Welcome everybody to Lung and Sleep and our eighth live patient education session. This is entitled, What are the best breathing exercises for your lungs? Now, firstly, we have Dr. Sean Yeo, who is a respiratory physician, and he will be presenting about breathing problems and the causes that might underlie a difficulty with your breathing. This will be then followed by Leah Jennings, who is a respiratory physiotherapist, who will talk about breathing exercises and what you can do to improve your own breathing. And Leah will also take us through some breathing exercises that you can do as we go. So I might now hand over to Sean and ask Sean to share his screen um, when you're ready and welcome Sean. Thank you, Barton. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, so as Barton said, um, my talk will focus on the medical causes um, underlying breathlessness. So I want this talk to be relevant. Um, so I want you to feel like you have an insight into what goes through the mind uh, of a respiratory physician or, or your general practitioner or a cardiologist when you see them and you tell them that you have shortness of breath or breathlessness. Um, and I'll also talk about um, what are some of the causes uh, for breathlessness when there's no problem with the heart or the lungs on our investigations. Uh, following that, I'll hand over to Leah and she will talk about um, how we breathe and how we can sometimes develop an abnormal breathing pattern and certain breathing exercises which can help with that. So what is breathlessness? So it is a complex perception that's influenced by biological, psychological, as well as environmental factors. Um, and it is frequently associated with anxiety. So um, if you think about um, the uh, breathlessness that's experienced by an individual who may have anxiety or claustrophobia um, and they're stuck in the lift. They may not have any problems with their heart or their lungs, but they may have a very acute and distressing sense of breathlessness. Um, now contrast that with an elite athlete who may be um, running a marathon at a world record pace uh, and not breaking a sweat. So um, th there's certainly a lot of factors, even though that athlete may be performing at the maximum of their capacity, uh, they, they may report a subjective sense of breathlessness that's much less than an individual trapped in the lift with claustrophobia. The other thing to note is that um, even when there is underlying heart or lung disease, the severity of breathlessness does not always correlate with the severity of impairment in lung function or um, impairment in oxygen levels. To give you an example, in the early days of COVID, um, especially during the Delta outbreak, there were a lot of patients in hospital who had low oxygen levels, um, but weren't really feeling short of breath. Um, similarly, there are uh, certain heart conditions, um, such as um, children born with a hole in the heart, where they may be blue, and the oxygen levels could be 75%, um, but they tell you they're not breathless. Now, if you contrast that with uh, a patient with asthma, uh, who is often very short of breath when they come into the emergency department with, with breathlessness and an asthma exacerbation, um, but often the oxygen saturations are in the high 90s. Um, so the, the level of oxygen doesn't always correlate with the level of breathlessness. And the same with the lung function test. Um, so it, we often see patients who have completely normal looking lung function tests, um, but have breathlessness. And they, there are a number of causes for this, which I'll go through shortly. And the, the issue with breathlessness is that um, not only is it distressing, but individuals who experience breathlessness, they learn to adapt and they modify their lifestyles to cope with the breathlessness. So they tend to avoid activities which may induce shortness of breath. And that in itself could then exacerbate the problem and cause a vicious circle. Uh, because the less exercise one does, the more deconditioned your muscles become and the more effort it takes to do the same level of exercise. So there are a lot of terms that, um, that patients often use to describe breathlessness. So it's often a frightening sensation if it's severe. Um, and if, if there's no cause or no treatment identified, often uh, patients describe a sense of helplessness uh, from their breathlessness. And it can sometimes be a smothering sensation or a constricting feeling in the chest or in the throat. Um, some patients use the term suffocating. Uh, probably the most common is shortness of breath um, or the feeling of not being able to get enough air or air hunger. Um, Patients with asthma might describe a tightness in their chest or in their lungs. 
Uh, in medicine, we use the term dyspnea, um, which has a, a Latin and Greek origin, um, simply meaning dys for difficult and near for breathing. So that's the medical term for, for shortness of breath. So if you saw that in your medical records, that's often what your, your doctor's referring to. Uh, so I promise today's talk will not be very technical, because I don't think that's why you attended today. And also, I want to, um, to make sure I still have a job at the end of today. Um, so um, the, the whole um, process of exercise involves oxygen coming into your body through your lungs, and that oxygen being supplied to the rest of your body by the heart. And the oxygen is carried in your bloodstream by red blood cells. And ultimately, it has to get to your muscles to exercise. The muscles then turn the oxygen into carbon dioxide, and it's all then the process is reversed, and the carbon dioxide is expelled from your lungs. So any problem within this pathway can cause a medical problem leading to breathlessness. And again, this is not meant to be a technical slide. Just wanted to show you that, um, in fact, the when you exercise, your heart can only increase the cardiac output, which is the amount of blood your heart can pump by about five times. So at rest, we have a cardiac output, most of us about five liters per minute. And at the maximum exercise, that barely reaches 25. So about five times um, in a non-elite non athlete. Whereas in the lungs, you actually have a lot of reserve and you can increase your, um, the amount of air you breathe in and out, which we call ventilation, up to 40 times. So at rest, our ventilation is about five liters. And usually at the end of the exercise, it gets to about 150 um, or, or over 100. So there's still a, a big reserve. So you don't, you're not actually maximizing your lung capacity, even at maximum exercise. The reason I put these slides up is to tell you that our bodies are not very good at pinpointing where the breathlessness is coming from. So it could be a problem with the heart. It could be a problem with lack of red blood cells or anemia. Um, but at the end of the day, your body senses shortness of breath as, you know, as, as a problem with the breathing. So it does not always indicate necessarily a, a lung disease that's causing it. So the, the causes of breathlessness that go through um, our minds um, include you know, heart causes such as heart failure, heart attack or angina, or problems with the valves in the heart, or irregular heart rhythms called arrhythmias. Um, being respiratory physicians, um, these causes are the, the pulmonary causes are usually front and center in our minds. So conditions like COPD uh, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, and emphysema, and, and this often occurs in in people who have had a significant smoking history. Um, of course, asthma is one of the most common causes for breathlessness. Uh, then you have less common causes like pulmonary embolus, which is a clot in the lung or, or pneumonia. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis, which is scarring of the lungs, and a pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung. Um, now, of course, these are just the, the more common causes, and the list goes on and on. Then if we've ruled out problems with the heart or the lungs, um, then um, other causes include problems with the muscle, because um, as I mentioned in, in that earlier diagram, the muscles um, are the organs that consume the oxygen and have to do the work of exercise and then convert that to carbon dioxide. So problems with the muscles, um, although rare, can, can also cause um, shortness of breath. Um, then um, anemia is the other main cause. So if someone has a very low hemoglobin or not enough red blood cells to carry oxygen around the body, it can make you short of breath. Uh, and deconditioning is, a, is a, a big factor, especially after the pandemic lockdowns and people doing less exercise throughout the pandemic. Uh, we're seeing a lot more patients who are deconditioned. So that's where the muscles um, have not been used as much um, because of a lack of exercise uh, and they become less efficient. So it takes more effort to do the same level of exercise. Uh, and lastly, obesity, again, um, with the pandemic and lockdowns, uh, we, we've seen uh, generally an increase in rates of obesity and and it causes shortness of breath with less and less levels of exercise. So then after thinking of all these medical causes, um, we also consider functional causes. And we don't often do that in sequence as I've presented. Sometimes we're thinking about these functional causes at the same time as we're thinking about the medical causes. Um, so one of the, the important causes of shortness of breath, which is being recognized more and more often, 
is the condition called dysfunctional breathing, uh, which Leah is, is um, going to expand on in her talk, um, and vocal cord dysfunction, um, which is a problem where the uh, vocal cords move abnormally when trying to breathe in and out. I'll talk more about this in the next few slides. Uh, but there is a significant overlap between all of these causes, and we know that uh, patients who have certain lung conditions like asthma or COPD tend to have very high rates of concomitant dysfunctional breathing or vocal cord dysfunction. Um, so all the expert guidelines now recommend that uh, we look for these conditions, uh, these functional problems at the same time as treating or investigating for other medical problems of so shortness of breath. Um, so how do we investigate the cause of breathlessness? So Sometimes the cause can be quite obvious. Um, so if someone's having, um, if someone has uncontrolled asthma and is wheezy and, and there's all the hallmarks of coughing and chest tightness, then sometimes it can be quite, um, quite clear from the start what's the cause. Um, but not uncommonly, we see um, patients who have breathlessness and uh, undergo a whole range of investigations um, with sometimes without much um, to, to find the end of it. And, it can be quite a frustrating process. So to give you an example, um, often your, your GP before even referring to a specialist would have sent you for an echocardiogram to investigate shortness of breath. Uh, that's an ultrasound scan of your heart. Um, they would have done a blood test to make sure you're not anemic. Um, and if there's still no clear cause, then often a cardiologist would be involved um, and they might perform a stress echocardiogram. Um, so that's where you exercise on a treadmill or a bicycle and they scan your heart after exercise. Um, and if there's any concern about blockage in the arteries of the heart or coronary artery disease, uh, then you may undergo an angiogram to look for the blockage and to fix the blockage. Um, then if you refer to a respiratory physician, um, often you, you'll have a lung function test um, to measure your lung capacity and how efficient your lungs are at absorbing gas. Um, and you would probably also have a CT scan to look for any problems with the lungs, um, such as um, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, and I thought I shouldn't leave out the cat letters in the audience. Um, and as I mentioned before, often at the end of all these tests, often there might not be a diagnosis. And this can be a very frustrating process, uh, especially if, if one is bouncing from specialist to specialist uh, and being told that there's nothing they can do to help you. Um, so at Lung and Sleep, you know, we, we strive to do um, our best for patients and the treatment doesn't end there with all these tests being negative. So what, what, what can be done if all your test results are normal and we don't find a, a disease of the heart or a disease of the lungs? And um, sometimes there may be a lung condition um, and we know the lung function is not normal, but what can be done to improve breathing even in the setting of having a, a lung disease? Um, so as I mentioned before, what, one of the functional causes for shortness of breath is called vocal cord dysfunction. So, so these are your uh, vocal cords or your voice box. Um, and normally when you breathe, your, your vocal cords are meant to open to allow air to flow in and out of your windpipe. Um, individuals who have vocal cord dysfunction have a problem where the, the vocal cords tend to close or spasm uh, when they breathe, and that limits the flow of air. And in severe cases, there can be a complete closure and patients can, can feel very short of breath and often end up in, in ED. And they, they may be treated for um, an asthma attack or sometimes even anaphylaxis. So some clues to vocal cord dysfunction uh, include a difficulty with breathing in. So the difference between vocal cord dysfunction and asthma is that asthma is often worse when breathing out. And that's when um, people with asthma tend to wheeze the most. Um, in vocal cord dysfunction or VCD, uh, the problem often lies with breathing in. So there may be um, a, a loud noise from breathing in, um, or the patient might describe to you that they can't breathe in, but they may be breathing out okay. Um, tightness in the throat is not a symptom, um, and this can be worse when talking. In fact, sometimes talking can, can, it can provoke an attack of vocal cord dysfunction. There may be a change in the voice um, or uh, either a hoarsening or a softening of the voice when the vocal cords spasm. And these attacks can happen very rapidly and can also resolve quite quickly. Um, whereas asthma tends to happen um, a bit less rapidly. So often over hours um, to a day or two, um, as opposed to vocal cord dysfunction, which can happen within, within minutes or even seconds. 
and it can be provoked by certain smells um, or odors. Um, so at um, Monash Medical Center, where um, Bart and myself and our colleagues, um, Tim and Sheetal, um, all work, there is a, a clinic um, that specializes in investigating and treating patients with vocal cord dysfunction. And one of the tests they do um, is to have a look at the vocal cords. Um, and if the diagnosis is not apparent, um, they sometimes expose um, patients to certain smells, which tend to trigger their vocal cord attacks and see if that can bring on an abnormal movement of their cords. Um, people with VCD often have normal lung function and they don't respond and they don't respond to prednisolone, which is the steroid tablets that um, often work for asthma. Now, the other uh, condition um, which often can cause breathlessness and, um, and have normal investigation results is a, a condition called dysfunctional breathing. And um, so it's, it's a condition where um, a person starts to use more of their chest muscles, uh, particularly the upper chest muscles to breathe. Uh, whereas in normal breathing, uh, you meant to use your diaphragms um, and that's called belly breathing. So, so this um, animation illustrates di the diaphragms. Um, so the diaphragms are the muscles that breathe, um, that, that are responsible for breathing when you're at rest. Um, so they're designed to work uh, 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week for your whole lives. And they're very sturdy muscles. Um, and subconsciously they contract. And when they contract, they expand your lungs uh, and air gets sucked into your lungs. And when they relax, the lungs get pushed up and air is expelled. So all that's meant to happen subconsciously. So you don't actually have to think about your breathing. Now, um, it's a simple test you can do, which, which um, Leah will um, talk about more uh, in her talk. But um, often what I get patients to do, even in the clinic is put the hand on your chest and the abdomen. And when you, if you're breathing normally with the diaphragms, you can see in that diagram uh, or animation on the right, the, the hand over the tummy is meant to move more um, than the hand over the chest. In fact, there's very little movement on the upper chest and most of the movement is in the abdomen. So that's normal diaphragm breathing. Um, and so let's go back to one slide. So the, when individuals start to use their chest to breathe, um, there's a group of muscles called the accessory muscles. So these muscles, they only kick in uh, usually when we're exerting ourselves or exercising. And they're very strong muscles that help to generate lots of force and suck as much air in as quickly as possible because that's what you need when you're exercising or running after the bus. Um, whereas if you, you start using those muscles subconsciously to breathe in and out all the time, then they can get tired and fatigued. And if you're really resorting to these muscles at rest, when you try and exert yourself, you don't have that, that reserve to push yourself any further. Um, so it is, it is a subconscious condition, this functional breathing. It's not, someone, it's not something someone chooses to have, but it can be a pattern of breathing that evolves over time because um, of an underlying lung condition. Um, some patients learn to adapt to a different style of breathing, which can actually then, uh, if anything, make their breathing even worse. Um, so th the, um, the good thing about lung and sleep is we have a team of dedicated respiratory physiotherapists uh, and I think that every good um, respiratory um, clinic should have a respiratory physiotherapist because these conditions are very prevalent and very under-recognized. Uh, and I've yet to have a patient who I suspect has had dysfunctional breathing who I've referred to our colleagues uh, in respiratory physiotherapy uh, and come back and said that they haven't had a, a good outcome. So I think all, all the patients I've referred um, have found uh, seeing Leo, Ellie uh, very helpful. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak again. Uh, as Barton and Sean have both said, my name is Leah Jennings and I'm actually the practice manager at Lung and Sleep. Um, but my clinical passion and use of training is really in physiotherapy and particularly in the area of respiratory care. So um, I will start to go through a little bit about the ins and outs and the best breathing exercises for your lungs. So as Sean and Barton have alluded to, this is Ali, Ali Kavanagh, who is a very experienced respiratory physiotherapist uh, and myself. Ali and I both trained uh, at Monash. Um, and between us, we have 30 years of combined, uh, combined experience um, in delivering respiratory care. So uh, I'd like to think I wasn't quite that old, but uh, it creeps up. 
We both have postgraduate qualifications. So I have a master's of cardiothoracics um, or master's of physiotherapy in cardiothoracics. And Ellie has a master's of philosophy in geriatric research. Uh, but over the last few years, um, with the particular, I guess, advent um, and starting to better recognise uh, the effects of dysfunctional breathing and breathlessness in the community. Um, Ali and I have both gone on to do some further study uh, in this area, and we are both cert certified Bradcliffe practitioners. So I will tell you a little bit about that um, as we go on. So the first thing, just to all let you know, the thing that we usually get asked is what, um, as a respiratory physiotherapist, what is it that we actually uh, do? It is a little bit of a, a niche area. So essentially, we um, specialise in assisting patients to optimise their breathing pattern, clear secretions. Uh, we treat uh, usually the dreaded cough that people come in with that just won't go away. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, it is breathlessness that we work with. So we do work with all of those conditions that Sean talked about uh, with COPD and emphysema, difficult breathing patterns, coughs, um, and we do a lot of work around inhaler and nebulizer education. Um, what we do really just provides an adjunct to, adjunct to medical management. So. Um, Usually uh, when we work really closely with the respiratory uh, specialists that you'll be seeing, um, and we talk really frequently about the best course of care uh, for you and your breathlessness. So from there, uh, everything as professionals that we are talking to you about tonight may really sound quite innate, like we just breathe and it happens. Um, and it is really something that you would think comes really naturally. Um, and it's, I guess we're born with the anatomy and physiology to make that happen. Um, but what happens can be, uh, what happens in our life can really impact so, be, uh, impact so much on our breathing um, and the many other things that happen in our life. So what does breathing well actually look like? Um, breathing, and I won't dwell on this, I'm a bit like Sean, we don't want to talk about uh, too much of the nitty gritty um, of anatomy and physiology, but breathing is really the process of moving air in and out of the body. And by nature, most of our breathing should occur through a nasal breathing cycle. One side um, of our nasal passage cleans and clears the air, while the other side filters and humidifies the air. The air then goes into your pharynx and your larynx and comes through the vocal cords. And the vocal cords is what is what produces speech, which is what Sean was talking about, um, and comes into the lungs, into the trachea and the bronchi and the smaller bronchioles. So breathing itself, like Sean described, is usually should be quite quiet. Um, it shouldn't be um, very difficult. Uh, when we inhale, we actively use our diaphragm. And when we exhale, it passively recoils. So it doesn't take much work. But it's really important that we understand, I guess, the linkages of breathing. So our breathing is not um, uniquely impacted just by the anatomy of our body. So the problem is um, that we have, uh, we have to understand the biomechanics of how the body works, the physiology of how the body works, and also the psychology of how it works. And so it, there's the thinking and feeling and, of experience and all of those factors. The problem is that when one of those systems, so when one of the biomechanics, the physiology or the psychology is out of balance, then we end up with what we term a dysfunctional breathing pattern. So when we think about the brain, we need to really start to think about um, where breathing happens. So in the brain, the location of the breathing center is in this lower part of the brain here. You can see really closely attached to it though, just above here is what we call the emotional brain. And this, um, I guess this image really tries to depict the really close relationship between um, mental and emotional influences on the regulation of our breathing. So if you get a stress stimulus in that yellow part of your brain, so something like maybe a work deadline is approaching uh, or you've got a bill due, you can get a release of chemicals that influences the breathing center um, to conduct your breathing in a certain way that ends up making you feel breathless, essentially. 
So this happens at a very subconscious level. Um, in the red part of the brain, this is your thinking brain here. And as um, it's really where we get our reasoning and logic from. So what we try to do in teaching you breathing exercises is really thicken this barrier of this part around the red brain that hopefully stops so many of the chemicals affecting the location of your, where your breathing's coming from. So hopefully as you get a thickening there and a better regulation, when you get in those stressful situations, then you won't get those strong chemical releases and changes in your breathing pattern. So really um, what we're trying to do is get a better buffer between the psychological influences and the physiological reactions. Has anyone seen this guy? So breathing retraining um, is certainly not a new phenomenon. And many of you may have heard of different breathing techniques. So there is um, Buteyko. So a Ukrainian doctor by the name of Constance Buteyko um, created the Buteyko breathing uh, technique in the 1950s. And it's really a breathing method to you, which uses breath retention exercises to control your speed of breathing and the volume of your breath. Um, and it helps you, it basically helps you to learn to breathe more slowly, calmly and effectively. This guy here is Wim Hof, um, who was a Dutch extreme athlete. And um, there's a bit of, uh, you hear a little bit right now um, about people using the Wim Hof method of breathing. Um, and it basically got, the, he got the name Iceman after breaking a number of world records related to cold exposure. So the Wim Hof method of breath retraining um, uses a combination of cold therapy and breath control to regulate your breathing. There's Soma breath, um, which use, utilizes breath control to maintain extremely low breath rates. Um, and that probably relates more to the meditation uh, or meditative practice rather than breathing um, retraining. So there's lots, um, lots of different breathing um, patterns. So like Sean said, I'm about to go in and teach you a couple of breathing exercises to get you started. But um, the things that people tend to report to us um, is often that they're mouth breathers. Uh, you can have a really hoarse voice, um, frequent yawning and sighing. So um, yawning and sighing is an interesting thing because it is actually a really normal, uh, normal pattern of breathing uh, or something that we do within our normal pattern of breathing. Uh, we usually sigh around 10 times per hour, but people with breathing dysfunction will often sigh a little bit more frequently. We sometimes hear people um, talk about a um, increased incidence of headaches um, or neck aches, um, upset guts sometimes, panic attacks, uh, cough sputum and throat clearing. Have you heard it? Have you ever heard people as they're talking to you, they just constantly go <clears throat> to clear their throat. That is often also a sign of a dysfunct dysfunctional breathing pattern. Uh, there's often wheeze um, or strider, which is that noisy, um, noisy breathing. So these are the things that we look for when we try to work out how best to treat your breathing issues. So from there, how do we treat breathing dysfunction? And the first thing is it's really education, education and education. And I'm not going to lie, it's not a quick um, it's not a quick fix. It's not something that you come in, we teach you to do and you go home and do it. But there is certainly things that you can um, start to learn to do and train yourself uh, to, get, uh, to get better. We use a Bradcliffe method um, and we usually start with breath retraining, usually in a supine position. That means lying down. Can you remember the picture that Sean showed of the patient lying down with the head supported on the pillows, the neck, neck and head supported? We sometimes put a pillow under the knees just to relax ourselves. And that is the first position that we will usually teach you to start your breathing exercises. And the reason for that is we need you at your most relaxed to be able to teach you something new or for your body to be able to learn something new. 
once we usually master um, breathing exercises in that lying down position, we usually then progress to a sitting or standing position. Um, and as a last step into that, we start to incorporate them into exercise. Because the thing that we know best is that if you don't practice these in a relaxed position, then at a time of stress, when your body's working hard and you're going for a run or you're walking upstairs or you're going up a hill, then you won't learn, your body won't remember to use that breathing technique um, at that time of stress. We do some inspiratory muscle retraining. So we we're talking about the diaphragm before and Sean showed that lovely slide of the diaphragm moving up and down. And we have um, seen uh, in a few patients that the diaphragm muscle actually can weaken. And one of the things we do is try to strengthen that with other um, breathing exercises, just like you would strengthen many other muscles in your body. Relaxation, nasal treatment. When I talk about nasal treatment, I'm, I'm meaning sinus care. So when I was talking earlier about how we breathe in and the breath coming in through our nose and the humidity and cleaning and filtering that occurs through our nose, if you have a really blocked nose um, or issues with your nasal um, passage, then it's really difficult to use it for breathing. So one of the things that we do recommend to a lot of people, if you have a lot of sinus issues, and particularly this time of year, is to use sinus rinse outs. Um, you can use flow rinse from the pharmacy and that's just a brand. There's lots of different sinus rinses that you can use. Um, and although they don't sound very pretty, um, they are probably one of the more effective things that you can do for your sinuses in terms of clearing them. Uh, and then you have a home program. So what I'm going to do is get you to start to learn how to breathe. Um, so what I'm going to do is invite you to participate um, in a really short activity uh, to discover how you're actually breathing. Uh, and feel free, I will get you to do some things quietly with your eyes closed. You're more than welcome to turn your camera off as long as you turn it back on uh, at the end. Um, otherwise, feel free to leave it back on, uh, leave it on as we go through. So the first thing I want you to do is just get yourself in a comfortable position. If your feet are touching the floor, relax back into your chair. And as you sit in front of your screens, I want you just to gently close your eyes, not tight, just loosely. And just relax as I asked you, as I ask you to reflect on a few of these questions that I'm about to ask you about your breathing. Where are you breathing from? Is it coming from your nose or is it coming from your mouth? Have a think about your breath in and out. And which one is longer? Is there a brief pause at the end of your breath before you take your next breath in? From your throat right through to your pelvis, where lies the focus of your breathing? Is it higher up in your chest or is the focus down towards your belly? As you think about that breath, think about the movement of your chest and your belly. And which one moves first? And which one moves more? So you can gently open your eyes again.
So the answers to these questions are the characteristics of what is termed normal breathing or diaphragm breathing. And if your answer didn't match those signs of breathing, then there may be a slight dysfunction in the way that you take your breath in and your breath out. So how do we actually go about resetting the diaphragm breathing? That's often the first thing that we need to do. So what I'm going to do now is just teach you a really common exercise uh, that we use. Um, and bear in mind that as I go through this exercise in a whole hour appointment with us, um, we will spend a whole hour often going through the finer details of this breathing. So this is really a bit of a, a shortcut version of how to reset your diaphragm. So I want you to go into your relaxed position again, feet on the ground if they're there, or just relax comfortably in your chair. So as you're sitting, make sure you're not slumped or crouched over. You must be able to relax your body, close your eyes and follow my instructions. During the pauses, just relax. The first thing is to loosen and shrug your shoulders up to your ears. Now I want you to make a double chin by chuck, tucking your chin into your throat. And loosen your lower jaw, so wiggle it side to side. Stretch your mouth out wide, as wide as you can. And just close your lips softly together. Rest your tongue on the back of the top of your teeth. And raise your eyebrows. Tune in to the flow of air through your nostrils. And your breathing is low, slow and long. And when you're ready, I'll get you to gently open your eyes and come back up. So I hope you are not all asleep at the end of that. So that is one gentle exercise that we use to teach you to use your diaphragm to breathe. 
So we relax you from the top down to your diaphragm and teach you to listen to your breathing. There are other techniques that we can teach you to use. Um, and these are used uh, in different settings, depending on where you are at in your breath retraining. So one of the other techniques we use is called breath, breath pacing. And it's a prescribed rhythm of breathing. And it's really good for regulating breathing during, uh, during everyday activities, particularly those activities that you know really trigger your breathlessness and your symptoms, like bending to get the dishes out of the dishwasher or walking up a slope in the driveway. You can use pursed lip breathing, which is for airway support if you have um, certain lung conditions. Breathing muscle strengthening, that's what we were talking about before with strengthening the diaphragm and vocal training. Uh, and then we also teach de-escalation -escal strategies. So in those times where you get that panicked breathing, how to bring yourself back down uh, from that. So in summary, the things that we really need you to understand is that although there may not be a medical cause um, that is evident uh, for your breath dysfunction, breathing, um, breath, the sense of breathlessness and breathing dysfunction is um, a real condition. And it's one that we are seeing more and more and more, particularly after um, uh, the pandemic and coming out the other side. Um, so there is that chemical, physiological and psychological um, impacts um, and we just need to remember um, that your diaphragm is your key breathing muscle. Um, and it is, has voluntary and involuntary controls, but with practice, we can teach it to work more effectively. So breathing retraining um, has been proven to work and um, it really adds, I guess, to the effects of other treatments that you may be on with your specialists or your GP. Um, it's a really safe, skill to learn. Um, it's a lifelong skill to learn um, and it has physiological, biochemical and psychological um, benefits. Um, the, I guess the main take home message uh, for you though is the thing that is required from you is the diligence to stick with it and practice it and to particularly practice it in times where you are not um, extremely breathless, where you can be more relaxed because if you can teach your body to use it then, then you are more likely to be able to implement that um, in times of extreme breathlessness. Um, and better breathing uh, is hopefully all leads to better living. So thank you very much um, for listening. Um, and I hope that was useful and I'm more than happy to take um, any questions. So I'll just stop sharing now, Barton. Excellent. Thank you very much, Leah. I um, certainly found those breathing exercises very relaxing for myself as I was sitting there listening to you. So um, <laughs> it's nice to see in the chat that we've got some other people commenting that they also found it uh, that way too. And I think it's interesting, isn't it, the, the link to, to breathing and, and mental health and how, how beneficial those sorts of exercises are in, um, with mindfulness and relaxation. And I think that's what we've learned more and more recently. Um, is that there is a really strong link. Um, and although sometimes breathing dysfunction can start from a place of um, a psychological stress, those physiological changes happen over time. So the longer you keep that level or that pattern of breathing and the more it slightly changes over time, you get different chemical releases in your body and it becomes a, a, a real uh, medical dysfunction. Yeah. We've got some uh, very good questions coming through, so I might just start to go through them. Um, Casey asked uh, a question about asthma and vocal cord dysfunction and said, can vocal cord dysfunction feel just like asthma? Maybe I might start with Sean on, on that one to seek your thoughts. Thanks, Casey. That's a very good question. Um, and it's a question that often even comes up amongst doctors. Um, so to answer your question, it, it can present very similarly. And often um, patients 
can be misdiagnosed as having asthma uh, and they may be given a lot of Ventolin or steroids, um, but the key is that if it is purely vocal cord dysfunction, um, a lot of Ventolin and steroids tend not to improve the condition very much, and in fact, might actually make patients more anxious and could actually worsen their vocal cord dysfunction. But the important thing to note is there is actually a lot of overlap. So in patients who have severe asthma, um, there is a very high proportion of them who also have vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, and it's important to keep that in the back of our minds. So even when we are treating patients who have confirmed asthma, we still often think about the possibility of vocal cord dysfunction and it, it can be quite difficult to, to differentiate the two conditions. So if we're, sometimes if we're not sure, uh, we refer them to the specialist clinic at Monash and they'll do a very thorough assessment. Thanks, Sean. Um, the next question from Phil was, he suggested that when he does breathing exercises, he sometimes feels dizzy. Yeah, um, I, I think, yeah, sorry, Sean, you go ahead. No, yeah, I might let you take that and add, add to the end. Um, so dizziness uh, is often um, a sense that of breathing too quickly that causes a feeling of hyperventilation. So breathing exercises, do need to be done frequently, but in shorter stints also. So often what happens is when we teach, um, do teach people to do their breathing exercises and start to learn and practice those things, you can't go and then practice it um, entirely, particularly if you're taking deep breaths in or if you're having trouble slowing your breath down and you're actually breathing quite fast, you can cause a dizziness sensation. So the most important thing to do at that point is to do them more frequently during the day, but for shorter periods of time. Um, and the key is to make sure that when you're doing them, you are actually in a relaxed situation because if you're in a stressed situation or it may be just a, a, a general feeling of you know, slight anxiety, um, then you will be much less likely to be able to use your diaphragm and fully bring the breath in and then take the breath out. What do you think about maybe if people are getting lightheaded, they may be hyperventilating. Uh, is mm -hmm. that what you mean? And so breathing ex excessively so too deep too quick so they're actually more air in more air out and the problem with that is that they're blowing off more carbon dioxide yes correct and that's what makes you dizzy hmm. yep uh, marina asked about how do you know if you are breathing correctly <laughs> i think that you went through that quite nicely, Leah, with the, uh, uh, five or six points that you can concentrate on your own breathing. Are there any other tips that might make you, somebody think that they might not be breathing properly? Um, for me, breathing is a very individual thing. Uh, I guess we spend, uh, I mean, all day, every day talking to patients about their breathing. Your breathing is only a problem if it's a problem for you. Um, and I think that's probably the first thing to, to understand. If you have other symptoms um, and someone is recognising that maybe it is related to breathing, um, then it's a matter of going back through the breath retraining. Um, but, you, it's, I mean, your breathing is really only a problem for you if in, in cases of um, stress or exercise or in times when you really do feel breathless, you are not able to bring your breath back down to a comfortable breathing level, then it's a problem for you. I think that's true. It's certainly something that you don't even think about when it's going well. And Tim Winton had that nice quote that went something on the lines of, I never really thought much about my breathing until it's all I could think about. Because yeah. um, that feeling of breathlessness is very distressing. But when you're breathing mm -hmm. normally, it's not something that even enters your mind often. It can be really different in different times of your life to um, you know it's not it's not a constant your breathing might be really great at one period but then not so great at other periods in your life yeah uh, Jacinda asked a good question about doing breathing exercises and how to do breathing exercises with your diaphragm while doing everyday tasks and said that it's much mm -hmm. easier to do it while lying down like the photo provided how do you do them when you're up and walking around and doing activity 
Uh, I would always say start start lying down. If you can manage to do it really comfortably lying down, and when you first start doing it, doing breathing exercises and teaching yourself diaphragmatic breathing, you may not be able to instantly lie down and do it straight away. You should be able to lie down and do it for you know five five minutes or in short bursts throughout the day for periods of time. If you then get to a period where you lie down and you think oh, that this is fine, I, I understand how to do it, transfer to sitting up um, and do it in a sitting position. And you may need to do that for a short period of time also. Once you master each position, then you can start to do it in uh, walking around, slow walking around, and then you will start to master it in exercise. And I think the key is to remember that when you are walking around doing um, doing just daily tasks, you know, it might be washing your hair or um, emptying the dishwasher and things like that. You're requiring lots of other muscles in your body to, to work at the same time. So unless you have got a very well-trained diaphragm um, that is able and breathing muscles that is able to just work without you thinking about it, um, then it's really hard to do. So it's just a gradual, a gradual progression. progression. The next question we've got here from Leisha was, why do I feel exhausted and yawn uncontrollably when my hay fever is really bad and might last an hour or leave me feeling quite drained? Sean, do you have a thought about how, how hay fever can affect uh, yawning? I know it, it makes me feel exhausted. It's a pretty bad time in Melbourne to have hay fever at the moment. Certainly. I think uh, I haven't seen uh, Telfast fly off the shelf so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> But that's a great question, Leisha. Um, it, it is actually one of the commonly recognized symptoms of having severe hay fever is the fatigue and the exhaustion. And I think there's, there's really probably two reasons why, uh, why people feel exhausted and tend to yawn when the hay fever is flaring up. Uh, I think the, the main reason is that it probably affects your sleep. So if you can't breathe through your nose and you're breathing through your mouth when you're sleeping, you're more likely to snore and, and, and get sleep apnea. Um, so that's probably one explanation. And if you're not sleeping well, then you, you'll get tired the next day. Um, the, the second reason is that even when you're awake, um, when you're doing activities, if you're, not being, if you're not breathing through your nose because of the hay fever, then you start to revert to mouth breathing. And when you mouth breathe, you're more prone to getting this functional breathing pattern. Um, so it just consumes more more energy for you to do the same task that would normally be simple for you to do. So I think those probably those are the two reasons why people feel tired when they're pay fever. And Sally's asked, what is um, pursed lip breathing? Sean, do you want um, to talk about pursed lip breathing? Yeah, so um, pursed lip breathing is is where um, usually on, on breathing out, I'll just demonstrate it. So people breathe through their mouth and they do this. And the reason for doing that is it's actually an adaptive mechanism to um, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, and to, to keep things, um, I guess it's um, fairly straightforward when you have COPD, when you try and breathe out, the airways inside your lung collapse. Um, so to compensate for that, um, the, by pursing your lips, you actually increase the pressure inside your windpipe when you're breathing out. So it's, it actually stops the airways from collapsing so easily. Uh, so it's an adaptive mechanism um, in patients who have certain lung conditions. Um, and it can actually sometimes help. And um, we often refer patients for pulmonary rehabilitation if they have um, COPD. Uh, and they'll teach you um, when to use things like pursed lip breathing and also other types of um, ways to deal with shortness of breath. Very good. Helen's asked about um, retraining your own breathing and should you do continual breathing practice throughout the day? Um, and if, if so, or if not, how often to retrain yourself? Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, I mean, you need to be reasonable about it, but when you first start, you need to do it frequently and depend, it depends on your lifestyle um, and what will fit in, but you're probably much better off doing short sessions and it might be, you know, doing it in the morning, then doing it if you're, if you're working, if you've got, you know, five minutes during, um, during the morning where you can, you know, close an office door or if you can't, you can't, um, doing it again at lunchtime, afternoon and then evening. 
And then as you start to get better at it and, and train yourself into different positions, you can actually do it a lot less frequently and you won't need to. You will find, it's like a lot of things though, you, st you do learn how to um, be a, um, a great with using your diaphragm and your breathing. Um, but often um, at times there might be things that trigger you off, something, you know, some event in your life or an illness. Um, it might be another respiratory virus. And you find that that happens and it sets you right back again. And then you have to go back to just starting to retrain yourself. But you will find the second and third time you need to go through that process that you can do it much quicker because your body does remember how to do these things. Um, so yeah, it just, it takes time, I would say, but to start off with, you know, three to five times a day, just for short periods, I'm only talking like, you know, two or three minutes um, each time. People sometimes find it useful to um, put like a sticky dot somewhere around the house or, you know, if you're doing your teeth or something, just to remind you, because it's really easy to, I mean, I do it all the time. I get to bed and I think, oh gosh, I didn't do any of the things I was meant to do. <laughs> today or my exercises um, so you need to remind yourself um, until it becomes a habit and habits take around you know 28 days to form so it takes practice to do it um, it feels got an interesting question here um, about can shortness of breath be associated with sleep apnea so I guess the, the question could be can sleep apnea be a cause for shortness of breath uh, or vice versa I find this quite interesting what do you yeah. think Sean yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and certainly a lot of um, interest uh, in amongst medical specialists in the association um, between sleep apnea and breathing problems. Um, so this, th there are quite a few links between the two issues. Um, so in some patients who have very severe sleep apnea to the point where their oxygen levels are very low for long periods during the night and their carbon dioxide levels are very high, um, so that can actually lead to a very severe condition where the blood pressure in your lungs goes up uh, and it's called pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and that can put a lot of stress on the heart and, and can cause severe shortness of breath. Um, and also um, in a, I guess, in a less direct pathway, if you have sleep apnea that's not treated, uh, it can actually increase your um, risk of having certain cardiovascular diseases like high blood pressure uh, and abnormal heart rhythms like atrial fibrillation. Um, so indirectly, if your sleep apnea is not, not treated, you're more at risk for having heart problems, which could then also cause shortness of breath. Um, so definitely, if whenever we see anyone with um, shortness of breath, we also, as sleep specialists, thinking about risk factors for sleep apnea uh, and certainly would investigate for that and, and treat it as well. Sean, do you find sometimes that people who have sleep apnea and are symptomatic of their sleep apnea, but their sleep apnea is not so severe as that it's caused underlying heart disease or dysfunction of other organs. But when you treat their sleep apnea with the CPAP, they report an improvement in their breathing? De definitely. Yeah, I've seen definitely seen um, cases um, of breathing improving with treating sleep apnea. Um, and not to go too much into, I guess, medical detail, but... Um, because when, when you hold your breath at night or you have an apnea, you actually generate a huge amount of pressure in your chest and that causes very large swings in, in pressure in your chest. And that causes the blood pressure in your main arteries um, to swing by a lot and can actually cause the heart to become stiff over time. Um, so so it's, it's a condition um, that is being recognized more and more called heart failure with preserve ejection fraction or basically in non-medical terms a stiff heart um, syndrome um, and uh, it's it's becoming uh, a bigger problem now um, especially with people having more risk factors for having sleep apnea and that's not treated uh, that the the large swings in the blood pressure at night can cause this stiffening of the heart mm -hmm. um, so if you talk to cardiologists um, they, you know, they they're also very clued into looking for sleep apnea and treating sleep apnea in their patients as well because sometimes it's a bit of a surprise, I think, that there's not an obvious cause for someone's shortness of breath, but it's obvious that they might have sleep apnea and treatment of the sleep apnea actually improves their shortness of breath. Um, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. And I think yeah. sometimes it may be also contributed to by the fact that people feel so much better with good quality sleep that they just feel better overall. Um, yeah, and definitely. That, yeah. To the... yeah, we can't, can't um, always state how, how important it is to have a good night's <laughs> sleep. I think if you 
not sleep if you're not sleeping well then you just start off the day from a lower baseline so definitely having your batteries recharged at night it just sets you up for you know for a better day hmm. very good and the last comment we had was um from phil asking about wim hof and asking him leah do you know if he's still alive and we're going in the ice bath chill the lungs question actually no i don't know that wim hof is still alive um, i think he is ice, isn't he is he i'm not sure I so. ice, ice baths are like becoming more and more um popular at the moment and probably one of the things to to think about um, with different breathing techniques because everyone um, there's lots of different methods out there and i think it's really important that uh, sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter the type of breathing retraining you do although i think from a, a dysfunctional breathing uh, method you need more of a, a processed um, uh, program but as long as you're committed to something and learn and stick with it then you know your breathing will will improve so yeah i think it's really interesting there's there's a lot to be said about um the different types of breathing uh, techniques around and i find it fascinating <laughs>